All right, so um, let's get started. Uh, I'm going to be talking about offense. So we'll get back to breaking things again. Uh, this talk is called Offense in Depth. Uh, just a quick little disclaimer, I'm not the first person to use this title or this term. Um, I couldn't think of anything else clever, so there you have it. Uh, before I describe what I mean by offense in depth, um, I'll give you a quick uh, little intro about myself. Uh, I'm a pen tester, security researcher. Um, I've only been in here in the Bay Area for about six months, but um, I kind of come from the East Coast uh, in the uh, DC area, give you an idea who I work for. Uh, I've worked both in public and private sector, and uh, I hold a number of uh, industry certs, etc. Uh, I'm a Kafuti on Twitter. Thanks, Space Threat, for having me here. Um, and thanks also to uh, Nick D. So I don't know if anybody here knows who Nicholas D. Petrillo is, um, but those of you who do probably know him um, for his uh, security research with Don Bailey uh, in regard to geolocating cell phones uh, with a lot of open source intelligence. Really cool stuff, but uh, I know Nick a little better because he's a former colleague and friend of mine. and. Um, my experiences with him were uh, uh, usually a little bit more real, uh, ridiculous. Uh, to give you an idea, some people might know Nick because uh, uh, one time he let a wild bird eat food out of his mouth and subsequently got some sort of bacterial lung infection. So that's kind of uh, interesting. Um, I know him a little better for griefing me in Minecraft and uh, flooding my subterranean palaces with ocean water. and. Uh, uh, another incident where he followed me into the bathroom with a handful of lettuce from a nearby salad buffet and um, essentially attacked me uh, or attacked my junk with a handful of lettuce while I was standing at the urinal. So uh, thanks, Nick, for encouraging me to come to this talk. I'm not normally one to do presentations at this sort of event. I got into hacking computers due to an overabundance of social awkwardness, not a lack of it. So uh, please keep that in mind uh, if I seem awkward or nervous or otherwise discombobulated, because I am. Um, so I'm going to be talking mostly about offense in depth. And what I mean by that is basically a little different strategy to the uh, typical pen testers methodology. Um, it's going to be taking a lot of content from some of these other talks, uh, really good content, especially in the meta post-exploitation talk by Val Smith and Colin Ames. Um, of course, there's some stuff by Mubix. And here, and uh, the Grux talk uh, about OPSEC at Zero Nights recently, super awesome. Definitely check it out for those of you who are a little bit more gray or on the black hat side. And uh, so what I mean by offense in depth is essentially that there are many ways to do things. So the old adage is that there are many ways to skin a cat. Well, I'm not particularly fond of that use of the term, but you know, there are many ways to do something. There's usually more than one right one as well. And defenders already know this, hence the defense in depth strategy, right? Or elastic defense. And the idea here is to layer defenses in such a way that they're redundant. If one fails, assets are compartmentalized. You know, your attacker can only get so far. You know, you, you, uh, uh, you do tabletop exercise in a way such that you know that certain components are going to fail and that attackers are going to get to certain segments of your network and are going to get to certain assets. So, um, you know, I've always heard the defense in depth strategy referred to as the security onion or layers of an onion. So, offense in depth, of course, is just to peel that onion, peel those layers away. Uh, yeah, there's going to be more than one. Very infrequently do you get a single vuln or the single exploit that gives you a remote shell, your root, you've owned the entire organization. Occasionally, yes, but certainly more rare in today's organization. And in thinking about uh, onions and security, I was trying to come up with some clever joke about how you know, they make you cry. I don't know, couldn't come up with anything interesting, but I thought this image was sort of amusing. The first thing that I try to do um, when engaging an organization for a pen test, um, and of course the first thing that any professional is gonna do is establish an ROE. And in that rules of engagement, it's not uncommon for me to have a bit of a fight with the organization just establishing the initial scoping um, in terms of what assets are in scope, what types of tests are allowed to be conducted, um, what the threat being replicated is, et cetera. And the point I try to drive home is to simply make it realistic. You know, that attacker's out on the internet 
uh, don't care that your CEO doesn't want to be bothered on the weekend. They don't care that certain systems uh, are out of scope in your eyes because they're critical. Uh, those are the systems that should absolutely be in scope. Um, and so I certainly try to drive that point home when establishing an ROE with a client. The whole point there being, again, to replicate real world threats. You know, we're not trying to replicate a pen tester on your organization. That's not the point. Um, the point is to assess the organization as a whole and how the security posture is going to stand up to the threats that are already out there, to the hacktivism, to the nation state espionage, or to corporate espionage. You know, there's a lot of different things out there, and it's important that when you're forming a pen test, you're trying to replicate what you're actually trying to figure out. And that includes social engineering. Um, you know, I frequently try to incorporate social engineering into a pen test. I see frequently uh, penetration tests that will separate the social, social engineering component out into a separate rules of engagement to be performed at a separate period of time uh, where the information from one engagement can't necessarily uh, uh, interweave with the information for another engagement. That's definitely detrimental to an organization. Uh, attackers, again, don't care about those types of restrictions. Um, furthermore, when you do conduct a social engineering engagement, leave all of your high value targets as potential targets. If you remove them, the big fish, so to speak, from the pool, then you don't know how they're actually going to respond given an attack. Um, and more frequent than not, the, uh, the CXO level people tend to fall the hardest for the attacks and for whatever reason they also be tended to uh, have very high privileges in an organization. And so your typical industry pen test, uh, I know nobody here would do it like this, but I've seen this frequently. They run a bone scanner, you know, type exploit, metasploit, take a screenshot of the shell, boom, there's your report. That's that's really not actionable beyond what a standard vulnerability analysis is going to give you. You know, where the bones are, are they exploitable, yes or no. You really want to know what is an attacker able to do with this information? How can they chain these exploits together? What's the actual compromise affected in the network? So a little bit more, bit more of a realistic approach uh, is a more standard penetration testing methodology I'm sure you're all familiar with. But most importantly here, I think, is a focus on the post-exploitation phase. And as opposed to a sort of linear approach uh, that the, you know, run a scanner, exploit, screenshots, and report would be, um, you know, this is going to be more cyclical, where, you, you know, you do your reconning and footprinting, vulnerability analysis, and you exploit. And the post-exploitation phase really is just a continuation of those original steps over and over until you've either reached your goal or your time has run out. It sort of depends on what the goal of the pen test was and again what the threat is that you're trying to replicate. And as I mentioned that should really be more cyclical than it should be linear. Now when uh, doing, so I've, I've performed a lot of penetration tests um, in large governmental organizations where Fortunately, the resources uh, provided to the penetration testing team um, was, was a lot. In other words, we had a, a, long, a long engagement, um, an upwards of six months to eight months at a time sometimes, uh, where we weren't you know, required to deliver a report until the end of that, and where we could use all sort of uh, uh, social engineering and spear phishing and, and everything in the organization as a whole. And when you're attacking networks that are that big, that are three or four million IPs um, in size in terms of their public-facing network space, you have to get a little bit creative with trying to footprint and recon and scan these organizations. So, you know, just pointing Nmap at um, you know three and a half million IPs is probably not going to yield you much um, after the first 15 or 20 minutes. There's going to be a lot of uh, uh, upstream providers that are going to auto shun you. Uh, there's going to be uh, devices at the actual uh, vendor end or at the target end that are going to auto shun you. So the whole point here is basically to beat the thresholds. You know, uh, stay. You know, consume IPs. I think Amazon's EC2 service is great for this. They probably hate it, but uh, they've got an elastic IP capability that's tied into their API, where you can essentially spin up uh, Linux hosts on a free tier for some period of time, 
and um, essentially script the ability to consume IPs as quickly as you want to. So as soon as you notice that your MMAP scan, as an example, stops getting responses, uh, you can quickly rotate your IP. It's all done at an added level, so you don't break any of the uh, uh, any of the current NMAP scans that are in process. All your traffic will still return to you, um, and that's you know it's really handy to be able to consume that stuff on the Amazon space. Uh, well, word to the wise: uh, when dealing with Amazon EC2 for pen testing, they don't allow it. Uh, that's only if they catch you, though. Um, don't scan 25. They're going to trigger that as being some kind of mail spam, and that will get your instance shut down. Um, obviously, don't host malcode. Don't use it as a phishing host. Um, they do respond to complaints pretty quickly. Try not to use it for your command and control, because again, if it does go down, it's just not reliable. Uh, if it does go down, you don't want to lose your, your, your uh, shells to all your compromised hosts. And uh, of course, uh, any kind of port scanning or pen testing, I'm pretty sure, violates their terms of service. So. Now, a lot of, um, oh, that's a pretty good typo. So a lot of the effort that I um, perform in a pen test is not necessarily, again, about just getting a shell back. And sometimes you can chain together multiple seemingly innocuous exploits to effectively rebuild the capabilities of a shell. And that's all you really initially want, right, to get an initial foothold on the system. You want to be able to list files and directories. You want to be able to read stuff on the system. You want to be able to write stuff to the system and ultimately perform some level of code execution. And um, typically, you, you can affect this by, you know, I've seen situations where a web server might have a dozen virtual hosts. Only two of them are actually, act, actually active and, and being mapped to on the internet with DNS. Uh, but if you can find some of those other hosts with, with uh, vulns that maybe um, are old, uh, old websites that people don't take the, you know, the OWASP top 10 coding practices to, um, and combine vulns for maybe three or different, four different virtual hosts on the same server, uh, ultimately to gain uh, effectively a shell. So once you do have some type of foothold in an organization, it doesn't necessarily have to be a full shell, like I said, but the ability basically to uh, abuse what access you do have, um, you start to engage in the post-exploitation workflow. So this is typically once you've already popped a perimeter host and you have the ability to pivot internally, um, but not always. So um, the basic workflow there, of course, is uh, you know, your first your infrastructure analysis, figuring out where you are, um, things like that, um, pillaging what's on the box, making sure you have some persistence to reconnect, um, and cleaning up whatever uh, logs or whatever uh, uh, signs you've left on the system, traces that you left on the system that an incident responder or a forensics analyst might pick up on. And of course, the ability to pivot off that host to other uh, resources in the network, which is the whole point. So some of the things, uh, some little tips that I'm going to relay uh, that help me when I do pen testing, I do a lot of very manual stuff. I try to avoid frameworks until the post-exploitation phase. Um, Metasploit is great once you actually get a shell on something, in my personal opinion. Um, so up until that point, it's certainly nice to have some of these other tools handy. Screen, I'm sure you're all familiar with it, um, but it's definitely good to have screen, all your sessions running in screen, so that if you lose your SSH session to one of your own boxes, um, you don't want to have that result in the loss of a hard-earned shell to a compromised host as well. Um, script, it's another thing that's really handy. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten onto a host and started catting out files and running um, local pilfering scripts only to realize that I've exceeded my scrollback buffer and I have to do it all again. Uh, so just run everything through script and it puts it all in a little, nice little text file for you and then you can end the script and, uh, and exfil that file. So to dig a little deeper on the uh, post-exploitation workflow, the uh, infrastructure analysis portion of it, of course, is uh, essentially once you've popped this perimeter host, the first thing to determine is uh, what, you know, where is this host in the network? What's it actually on? Is it, uh, is it a dual home machine with an IP on some RFC 1918 network as well as some public facing network? Or is it behind a NAT? Uh, is it behind a firewall, most likely? What are the neighboring networks? Are there static routes in place? You know, what can you gain, what can you learn about this machine um, to understand what the surrounding environment is like? Also important is to figure out who else is connected to the machine. Are there any admins connected? Are there anybody, is there anybody connected from the internal network? 
Are their customers connected or external facing people connected? You know, what can you do with that information? Maybe you can man in the middle some of that. Maybe you can sniff some of that traffic and reuse credentials. It's hard to say. Also, of course, important to understand what protocols are in use, um, mostly to determine what services are on the system, but also how people interact with the system, how people interact with the network uh, to know kind of what you should be prepared for. A lot of this can be done for you by just running NetEnum and Interpreter. Um, of course, part of the point of this is to figure out a way to exfiltrate data. Um, so establishing comms is usually pretty easy to go out some type of cryptid port like 443. Um, I, uh, I saw an interesting analysis one time about a very large Department of Defense network um, about traffic that was leaving the network. And what I noticed that was particularly odd about this analysis that is that one of the highest items, one of the most common items for traffic leaving the network was SSH. So uh, it's really not that hard to blend in with SSH. Uh, very, very few organizations attempt to actually man in the middle and, uh, and stop that traffic and decrypt it with certs. So of course, on the boxes that you have popped, you want to get as much off of them as possible. So as, as Kyle's talk mentioned, you know, exploiting things is great and all, but it triggers IDS, you know, it triggers AV. Um, sometimes it's just hard, and it's hard to find something to exploit. Sometimes there's nothing to exploit, or there usually is, but you just haven't found it. So if you can, it's better to just use what access you already have, you know. Um, rip credentials off the machine, crack credentials off the machine, uh, replay hashes, whatever you can do to avoid exploiting again is certainly going to keep you under the radar. Um, interpreter has some great options for this in terms of uh, privilege, ex privilege escalation, the incognito extension, and the priv extension. And of course, it's kind of bad in a pen test not have your, your CPU doing something. So it should always be doing something. If it's not cracking a hash somewhere, I don't know, maybe mine bitcoins, get it to do something. Um, on the boxes that you are on, of course, grab the SAM, password, shadow files, crack away. Um, during the entire pen test, from start to finish, as soon as you get your hands on hashes, you should be trying to crack them the entire time. I have had pen tests where on the very last day, a password that I've been cracking for three weeks finally has cracked and I've been able to use it and it's gained me some extra capability. So uh, certainly useful. Um, dumping password hashes from memory is always hilariously uh, effective as well. Uh, lots of great tools to do that, some in Metasploit as well. Reviewing bash history is actually one of my favorite things to do on Unix boxes because it gives you a really good idea of not just what the admins and the sysadmins of the systems are up to, but how they think, what their skill level is, how they operate with the system. Uh, you can pretty, usually get a pretty good idea by reviewing log files uh, how organized they are, how often they review log files, uh, things of that nature. Uh, may also indicate implicit trusts. You can see where, what other hosts uh, this particular host has been connecting out to. Uh, SSH is ex as an example. Clear text passwords. Um, yeah, you'd be surprised how often I see SU mistyped. It's really, really hard to grep for a typo of SU though. So you kind of have to just scroll through the bash history uh, to find. But very frequently, people will mistype SU and muscle memory will kick in. They'll immediately type their password before reading the output. So following the, uh, the typoed SU, you'll frequently find the root password as well. And of course, there's always fancy stuff in the, uh, in the SSH directory. Um, if you want to crack the private key, you can try. Or hopefully there's no password on it. You can just reuse it elsewhere. Might help to know what's in the known host file to figure out where you might be able to use that key. And of course, the uh, authorized keys list might give you some indication of whether boxes are connecting here. So maybe you can Trojan something like uh, a PAM module to grab some SSH passwords as they're inbound. Um, some other options might be to drop a kernel rootkit on a box. Uh, I find that that's sort of frowned upon <laughs> during a pen test. Um, anytime incident responders or sysadmins have to uh, do a lot of work as a result of your pen test in terms of cleaning up, um, they usually don't like that. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not really sure. I would say if a machine has been popped because of you, 
go ahead and burn it down and rebuild it from scratch because chances are it's been popped by somebody else as well. So the whole point there being, you know, in an actual pen test, if you're in a professional organization, you probably don't want to destroy native binaries. Um, Black hats don't care about this, so ignore all that. But um, some ways that you can get around that and still be able to drop Trojans is by abusing the path precedence. You got kind of a couple options of doing that. You can place your files in the highest precedence of path. So just you know, see what the existing path uh, structure is and drop your files in the, in the directory at the highest precedence. Or you can simply add the location uh, that you've dropped your file into the highest precedence of path. Um, or of course, you can move the existing path directory to the highest precedence. So whatever, whatever you want to do, you can do it. Um, another approach might be to uh, use an alias uh, that takes precedence over path, which can be handy in some situations. Um, hard links can also be used. Those do look a little fishy, and I've been told by incident responders, um, actually, after doing this talk at other places, not to do that, because that's sort of obvious, so FYI. And of course, build, uh, avoid uh, trojaning bash built-in commands. Uh, you'll have all kinds of trouble with actually getting those to work. Now, this is one of my favorite trojans to use on a system, actually, um, kind of in relation to the SU. Uh, simple little bash file. I don't like to drop uh, Trojan binaries on a machine if I can avoid it, not only uh, because of the issue of destroying what's there, um, but also because they're a lot easier to pick up with AV. You know, something like this, uh, this is just a, a native bash file. There's really not a whole lot in terms of AV that's going to uh, discriminate this as being malicious in any way. Uh, and it just deletes itself when it's done and writes you a little password to a uh, password file for uh, exfiltration at a later time. And of course, once you are on a machine, other things that you can plunder are web directories. There's lots of interesting stuff in web directories. Um, grepping for variations on user and password through the directories, um, more than just through config files, too. Grep recursively through the entire web directory because I frequently find uh, copies and backups of old code or old config files stuffed in some bizarre temp directory that's you know, 10 or 15 directories deep within the web root. Um, grep for database calls to the uh, various databases. Those usually have clear text passwords in them, at the very least usernames. And of course, pilfer all the web configurations that you can. Um, you certainly will find clear text passwords here, um, but a lot of useful, other useful information as well. Um, Web logs are a great thing. Access logs are, are a wonderful thing, especially when uh, organizations are using URL parameters to track t uh, authorization tokens. Super easy to scrape out of an access log. And of course, databases are always rife with interesting information. So credentials that you might have scraped from any of the previous configurations, try to get into databases with them. Um, the information found in the databases may not be directly useful to you as an attacker uh, from a monetary standpoint or to the organization really, but you might be able to use some of that information to add context to uh, additional social engineering attacks uh, for end users to get what you're really after. Again, that sort of depends on what the goal of the pen test is. And of course, if uh, the database is storing clear text passwords, well, that's always great. So we know that uh, credential reuse is pretty rampant among users. Even among sysadmins and security people, I've noticed this. Um, poorly hashed passwords or um, hashed passwords without a salt, as we know, all super easily crackable. And performing some level of basic host forensics can be useful to pen testers as well. Now, admittedly, I don't get on a lot of workstations when I do pen tests. Um, unless I'm doing spear phishing, and even then, I usually try to go straight for credentials as opposed to getting code execution on a workstation. But when you do, there can definitely be some interesting things to look for. Run history, what, uh, what's in the recent docs, password files maybe, recently opened files from Windows Explorer, all stuff that can be found in registry keys or in various default directories. Some other uh, default stuff, uh, recently opened Microsoft Office documents, network shortcuts, et cetera, might give you some um, interesting places to peruse. Last logged on user is kind of interesting as well. How, how often do the admins connect to this machine? 
Um, or does the admin connect with his own low privilege user account? Or does nobody ever connect to the machine? All good to know. Printer spools, um, hijacking printer spools can yield some very interesting information. Um, I've had varying luck with this, so I'd be curious to see if anybody else does this in pen tests and, and if they've gotten anything useful. But uh, um, the situations where I have attempted this successfully, um, it has yielded information that can be used in conjunction with social engineering attacks. So um, usually very valuable. And some other stuff for Outlook, mail, might be interesting. IE is always rife with inf interesting information, uh, cache and history, cookies, typed URLs. Um, this can be particularly useful for admin workstations. So you can see all of the, uh, the admin administration panels and web services they go to, um, if they do have any password autocompletes or, or anything like that, uh, form autocomplete, save, type URLs. Firefox has much of the same. Stealing cookies can certainly be useful. And of course, once you've uh, gotten much, as much of the low-hanging fruit off the targets as you can, or at least off the machines that you already have some level of code execution on, you want to maintain some type of persistence. Well, this isn't always necessary, but usually the target that you're on, you're going to have some reason to need to return to it. It's usually because you don't know yet what the usefulness of that box is. That's frequently uh, why I find myself returning to a host is, you know, I've got a shell on it, I've done some basic host forensics, figured out where on the network it is, figured out its basic use. Um, but until I get further into the pen test, I realize that there may be something on there that may be even more useful. And maybe it's just the way uh, that that host operates within the application stack. Uh, but of course, the vulns that you use to exploit and gain control over these systems are eventually going to get patched. Um, if they showed up in an IDS somewhere, they may get patched sooner rather than later. And of course, some exploits are just one use only. You know, once you exploit it, you burn the exploit. It doesn't work until you reset it to a particular state or whatever the case might be. So there are various strategies. So I, I talked a little bit about kernel rootkits. They are certainly more reliable and harder to detect detect, but they are frowned upon in pen test engagements. Um, engineers and sysadmins don't like to have to rebuild systems after you've popped them, um, whether it's a good idea or not. Another approach, uh, something that the uh, guys in the meta exploita post exploitation talked about is to actually add vulnerable code. And this can be done with varying degrees of danger in my mind. So adding vulnerable code could definitely be bad if uh, you added vulnerable code and some other hacker found it and exploited it uh, before you were able to remove it. But it can also be a great way to obfuscate um, command and control over these systems when you don't have an easy way to establish a, a typical shell. If you can't get a interpreter shell on a machine, maybe you need to establish some type of web backdoor and you don't want to actually install a web shell somewhere, so maybe you want to uh, add some code on one of the heavily used web pages where you can you know, perform some sort of uh, customized injection attack, hopefully with some sort of, sort of secret key or password that you've used to protect that. Another option, of course, is to install a backdoor, like I mentioned. Always risky if it's not protected because, again, if somebody else finds that while you're in a pen test, uh, you're going to look really, really bad. You're probably going to get fired. Um, of course, it's just important to be creative and have contingencies when it comes to this stuff because you have to assume that at some point incident responders are going to catch up to you or maybe they're just going to get lucky and they're going to just shut a machine down because it's end of life or something like that. But if that was your pivot box into the network and you don't have a way to gain control back into the internal network, you're kind of screwed. So it's important to have some contingencies to be able to reconnect. So I generally like to use the existing remote administration tools on a machine. Um, VNC, we all know, is very bad. But if it does exist, a uh, couple different strategies to use. You can replace VNC with the, uh, the vulnerable version of VNC where you can just bypass it with no password. Or if you can get on a box with VNC and you can uh, get the 
password out of the registry key, as was mentioned. Uh, it's a great way. It's probably being reused on every other machine. RDP is always handy uh, as a remote administration tool um, and as a remote hacking tool. And uh, of course, if you do have uh, you know, network access to these hosts, using the at command on Windows host to run commands of the network is really, really stealthy. Um, doesn't leave a whole lot on the machine to be found. Um, and I don't see a lot of organizations looking for this on the wire. I also don't know a lot of organizations where the admins actually use this for legitimate functionality. So um, this may be used more maliciously than it is legitimately in some organizations. I'm not sure. All right. And so, of course, using all of the native administration tools is going to give you the best ability to stay under the radar, not trigger IDS, you know, not, not make people suspicious or make admins or security people suspicious of what's going on on that host. And when I'm placing shells on machines, um, I try to be um, somewhat stealthy with it. You know, Windows host, it's a little easier to do because you can just rename it SVC host. Everything runs as SVC host in Windows um, or rename it Internet Explorer, whatever. Um, in uh, the Windows land, if you don't have privileges, you can almost always write to the uh, app data local temp. So you should be able to write shells there if you need to. And Linux, uh, pretty much in most flavors that I'm aware of, you can always write to temp as well. For the AV evasion tactics, of course, if you're going to drop a shell on a machine, if you can manage to, just write something up you know, with bash or something else. But if you have to actually drop a binary on there that might get detected with AV, well, uh, there's a lot of ways that you can bypass that. Uh, you know, first, you're probably going to want to figure out what AV they're going to have on the system so you can test it and make sure that your shell does bypass it. Virus total um, is useful in that area, but if you actually want to know, you know, if they're running Kaspers Kaspersky on their box, you want to know if your shell is going to trigger Kaspersky, you need to probably set that host up running the same OS and the same version of the AV and test it out. Uh, how do you figure that out? Well, you might be able to just call them up as like an uh, antivirus sales engineer and try and sell them some new antivirus, and when they tell you no, they don't want it, Ask them why and who they use. Maybe they'll tell you. I don't know. I've never tried. Uh, better way might be to just spear phishing people. Um, you don't even need to really make this malicious in the sense that you're trying to gain a shell or get uh, passwords from anybody. Uh, but just get them to uh, visit a website so you can run some JavaScript and enumerate what browser plugins they have and typically figure out what type of AV they're using doing that. Job boards, of course, are a great wealth of information otherwise for technology. So certainly check there if all else fails to figure out what antivirus might be in use in the organization. Uh, sometimes to beat the antivirus, all you have to do is just change the hash. I've literally seen situations where if I drop a null at the end of a binary, suddenly now it's not detected. Now, that's pretty ridiculous, but uh, it does exist. Um, there's uh, certainly the option of packers that will pack the, the uh, shell with some other binary and encrypt it, and it will only unpack it at runtime. Uh, there's assembly ghost writing techniques as well adds a bunch of junk calls and stuff like that to make it look like something that it's not. So there are some tools that use a, a bunch of these techniques in conjunction with each, each other. Uh, I believe there's one called Hyperion, which I haven't actually tried, which is a Metasploit extension. Anybody here familiar with that? No, apparently. So anyway, check it out. Um, also, uh, a lot of AV, for some reason, lets sign code go by, uh, even if it's self-signed. So FYI, try it out. It might work. So more and more about uh, command and control. You know, as you've got these shells on the machine, assuming you bypassed AV, you've been able to hide it, um, you want the thing to call home. You probably don't want to have it uh, host some sort of listening service that's easily identified by m remote users, you know, something else that other attackers might start probing. So you don't want it to have uh, connections going back to your command and control server so often that it's going to be an obvious anomaly to an incident responder or a security analyst. Um, but you also don't want it such that if you lose your connection, you're going to be waiting six hours or a day or more to regain connection. And again, you certainly don't want to have to re-exploit if you can at all uh, avoid it. So uh, the strategy I typically use, and this, again, you have to sort of uh, take this on a case-by-case -case basis depending upon how stealthy you're trying to be and what kind of environment you're trying to pen test. But 
strategy I typically use is to place multiple call block shells on each host. So if somebody does eventually catch up to it, they see one particular callback shell going to one particular IP on a particular port, they're probably going to find that, probably going to block the IP at the network, or maybe they're going to get on the host itself and find the file. But if there's two or three others doing the same thing at different intervals to different IPs and different ports, how likely is it they're going to find all of them? Well, in a good instant response shop, once they think a machine is compromised, hopefully they're taking it offline. So hopefully they get all of them in one shot. But that's why you also place shells on multiple hosts. So it's all about, again, beating the thresholds, making sure you have enough IPs to consume so that uh, not only your scanning and reconning doesn't get blocked and shunned, but so that your command and control uh, is never an issue and you always have new routes to your, uh, to your C2 server. And of course, you want to make sure that uh, you do clean up the hosts that you're on, um, not just from an incident response perspective, um, but just from your own personal knowledge so that you know exactly what traces you're leaving on these systems. I think it's a good practice to actually go back, make sure you clean everything up. Um, especially good for black hats and gray hats that are, uh, that this particularly affects, you know, pen testers doing this in the legal context don't often have to worry about cleanup uh, because they've, you know, they've gained their shell, they've gotten the access to their data, they've done their report, at that point they don't really care. But there's a lot of strategies to use to clean things up, you know, remove everything in var log, uh, remove any aliases or links or crons that you might have used or scheduled any at jobs in the Windows world you might have scheduled. Uh, sus suspicious commands from bash history certainly helps to get rid of those. Um, you're probably going to be catting out a lot of stuff from proc. You know, I can't imagine that stuff uh, is going to look normal. Time stomping files. Um, I've heard helps in some contexts. Uh, certainly not foolproof, but it can help create some confusion when an insert responder is trying to create a timeline for an attack. So confusion. As far as I'm concerned, always aids the attacker and benefits the attacker. And of course, Meterpreter comes in most useful when you're trying to pivot and you're trying to actually uh, utilize the compromise that you've already gained to, gain, to get further into the network. So um, some manual pivoting methods, port forwarding methods there, of course, in the Interpreter shell that you can use. That's where the, all the auxiliary modules in Meterpreter come in real handy. There are some situations, though, where your standard callback interpreter shell is not going to work, and you have to get a little bit more creative with trying to achieve some sort of command and control. So I've seen situations where um, you've achieved some type of code execution on a host, uh, inbound to the host, let's say port 80 is open. Let's say it was a web server. Um, the firewall admins did a decent job on the DMZ. They're not allowing this host to make connections outbound anywhere. And of course, you don't want to take down the web server to host your listening shell to connect to it because it's going to be kind of obvious and the admins are going to be on the box in no time. So in that situation, you could drop a web shell, maybe uh, use the web shell to upload and execute a interpreter as a local listener, and then use an IP tables uh, NAT rule to finagle the traffic around through the open firewall port but uh, to the local listening port instead of having to take down the web server. So there are some other tools apparently that are out there to do this. Um, FindSock is, uh, is a PHP shell that was supposed to do this for established PHP sockets. Um, I believe there's been some uh, tools added to Meterpreter as well to do this. Um, admittedly, I haven't looked recently, um, but it would be useful. And of course, on the machine itself, uh, extending once you're pivoting through and you want to extend your presence as far into the network as possible, the goodies are not usually on the perimeter in the DMZ. So as I mentioned earlier, run it using the at command to run commands uh, over the network on Windows hosts is particularly useful. It doesn't require anything but credentials, essentially. And uh, pass the hash module and uh, Metasploit, another super handy thing. doesn't need to be in Metasploit. There's a lot of standalone tools to do that as well. Um, as Kyle mentioned also, if you do find passwords anywhere or anything that even resembles a password, mix and match them with all the usernames you found, all the other passwords you found, and try them on everything. Uh, very, very frequently I will find uh, some old password in some backed up web config file that doesn't work on the web config anymore, 
but it's the root password to some other box, you know, two subnets away. So it's certainly, certainly useful to try. And uh, if you can all avoid it, certainly try not to exploit additional machines because, again, you know, that's the kind of stuff that's going to trigger AV. That's the kind of stuff that's going to trigger IDS. Or if it fails, it might just knock a box over, and that's not very useful to use an attacker. Social engineering, um, again, in combination with pen test, I find social engineering hilariously effective because very frequently I'll spend um, months uh, trying to affect some sort of remote compromise without ever dealing with a single human, uh, at which point, you know, in the last week or two of the pen test, I'll engage uh, with a spear phishing attack and uh, get a lot more Prog get a lot more uh, progress into the network than I would have otherwise. I had a little example of one that I tried to uh, redact a bit here so it's at least somewhat anonymous from last year. This is a spear phishing email uh, I sent out. Basically, the gist here is that, hey, uh, some new cybersecurity policies say that you need to change your password because we've got some new complexity requirements and you, you're not playing by the rules and your password doesn't meet those requirements. So we're going to shut down your access if you don't follow this link and log in right now. So, of course, the vast majority of people logged in, reached this website, gave me their domain logins, and uh, sorry for the heavily redacted screenshot there. So that went out to about 3,000 people, and I had over 1,000 people actually hit that site, and about 850 gave me their domain logins. Um, I had domain admin about 15 different ways in this particular organization. So... Sometimes it helps to just do the spear phishing right up front. The takeaways from this, well, like I said, there's many ways to skin the cat, or in this case, to peel the security onion. So be creative. And thanks. And do we have any questions? We've got about two minutes. See one right across here. Go ahead. Thanks. So I, I actually have a bunch of questions. Uh, hash dumping and or the general class of credential reuse techniques, that is super, super easy to catch. What percentage, and if you guys don't know how to catch that, get at me later and we'll talk uh, because you should be. Um, what percentage of your clients catch that? To date, zero. Okay. Uh, you haven't run a pen test on us, so that's good. Um, at jobs, also super, super easy to catch. Uh, if you're actually doing analysis, what percentage of your clients catch that? Again, zero. Uh, PS exec, also super, super easy to catch. What percentage of your clients catch that? I think you're uh, going to find a common theme here. Zero. And then uh, a semi-pro tip uh, on the persistence, try Python. I'm sorry, I missed the last try. Try Python. Uh, if you're running against a Mac or a Linux, 20 lines of Python in user land is all you need. And if you're running against Windows, Py to EXE, and you're off. Yeah, awesome. I love the idea of using uh, you know, native, native scripting languages in the environments rather than trying to drop uh, you will binary never get catch. Yeah. You will never get caught with Meterpreter. I mean, we will catch you with Meterpreter. Uh, AV and other tools will not catch you uh, with Python. That's it. Thank you. Any other questions? We got one over there. Oh my gosh, I got the full lunch out here again too. Hi. Um, so do you run across Apple or Mac uh, workstations often? And if you do, uh, what is your what is your rate of success when, for example, doing phishing against people that run Macs? So, um, as I mentioned earlier, I don't, I, I don't target a lot of workstations. Um, so to date, no, I haven't encountered a lot of Macs. There has been some situations where I have. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of useful uh, info gathering that you can do on Macs. There's a lot of other post exploitation info out there. Uh, specifically for OSX that I didn't include. Um, I'm certainly not an expert in that realm, so I'd be curious to see you know, uh, what other strategies you guys use in the OSX world um, to perform essentially the same thing. Cool, thank you. 
Okay, I guess that's about it. Um, and we're sort of back on schedule, but not really, so let's make it about a five minute break. And uh, we'll see you soon. <laughs>